Sweet. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Amelia Schmidt, and I am the youth pastor here as well as a part of the teaching team. And I am so excited to be here with you this morning. So if you haven't been here uh, the past few weeks, we are currently in a series called The New You. Uh, and in this, we are going through a few different passages in the New Testament that talk about the transformative nature of knowing Christ how knowing him and being in a relationship with him changes us from the inside out. And as I was thinking this week about transformations, I started to think about famous transformations like in movies or TV shows. And my favorite one is the transformation of Mia in The Princess Diaries. And there's this scene when uh, Mia, who just found out her grandma is a queen, and so she is actually royalty, and this average teenager whose real name is actually Amelia, which was pretty neat, that's why she was my favorite when I was younger, um, she doesn't look like a princess in the stereotypes of what a princess should look like. And so her grandma brings in this man named Paolo and his two assistants to give her a makeover. And so we finally um, get to this scene where they are about to reveal the new Mia. And Paolo says, only Paolo can take this and this and give you a princess. <laughs> and the new Mia is revealed and she is completely transformed on the outside, at least. <laughs> And so as I was thinking through this, I started to think about my own transformation. Um, and I started to think about what middle school me looked like. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there's a, there's a couple pictures. So I, yeah, I uh, went through phases with having glasses and then got contacts right before I got my braces. Um, and then I had acne and I had three foot long hair. Like, yeah, three feet long hair, three feet. I could sit on it. Um, and then I chopped it off in eighth grade. Um, that's when the acne came in. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, middle school me, I look pretty different now. Um, the only similar thing really is I'm still short. Um, <laughs> That hasn't changed. I've been the same height as I was in middle school. So, um, But physically, I look pretty different. Normally, I have curly hair. Today, I straightened it, because why not? Um, <laughs> but I, I have transformed physically from when I was in middle school. But that's not the only way I transformed. I mean, every area of my life is completely different, whether that is physically or emotionally or mentally, relationally, and spiritually. I've grown and learned and matured um, through the various experiences I've had, through uh, the people that I have had relationships with, through uh, lots and lots of school <laughs> and jobs and, and everything. It has been transformational for me. And it, growth is healthy. It's good to look at what needs to change and be willing to make those changes because we shouldn't be the same as we were in middle school, if we're 20 years later, or however, however many years later, we should change, and we should be changing and growing as we go through life. And so today we are going to be looking at Colossians 3 and what Paul has to say about our transformation in Christ. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Colossians 3. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have a bunch in the back of the room in between the small group wall and the missions wall. Um, feel free to help yourself to borrow or take one if you want to keep one. We have plenty, so help yourself. Um, for those of you in the room and online, it will also be on the screen. So Colossians 3, um, Paul starts out by saying, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For when Christ, who is your life, appears, you, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he starts out with, since then you have been raised with Christ. And we didn't look at chapter 2, but there's actually a part in there where Paul um, talks about how since they're in Christ, they have freedom from following the religious rules made by humans, rules about what they can and cannot eat or touch or drink or do. But really, those things had nothing to do with their relationship with God. It was just, this is what you do. And in verse 220, he said, since you died with Christ 
to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? And so we see these two similar statements here. Since you died with Christ, and then chapter 3, since you have been raised with Christ. And we see Paul talking about the significant reality of those who are in Christ, those who have a relationship with him. We have died with Christ and we have been raised with Christ. And this is a recurring theme we see throughout Paul's teachings and throughout the New Testament. I mean, we see it in Romans 6, 2 Timothy 2, Galatians 3, and more. This idea that we participate in Christ's death and his resurrection. And a beautiful illustration of this is actually baptism. Because in baptism, there is this this element of participating with Christ's death as you are lowered into the water. And then as you are lifted out of the water, it's as if you are participating in his life. And in that process, your sins are washed away and you are made new. And it, like Mike was saying, we get to have baptisms today. So how perfect is that? <laughs> and I encourage you, please stay for that because it is a beautiful, incredible thing that we get to be a part of and surround those who are choosing to, to step into this, to choosing to make that statement of this is what I believe and I'm going to show you all. So stay for that. It'll be great. Um, but this, this reality is more than just a beautiful imagery or a nice idea. It is a reality that we need to fully embrace in our lives. And once we do that, it also has significant implications on our lives, which we'll see throughout this passage. One that we see in verse 3 is that your life is now hidden in Christ, hidden with Christ in God, which means it is completely secure. However, this does not mean that we should hide our life in Christ from others because if the world doesn't know you belong to Christ because of how you act or think, that's probably not a great thing. But more that our, our lives are hidden and kept secure with Christ in God. It is his. Our lives are his. We are his. And the Greek word here for hidden is krypto, which is spelled crypto. But thankfully, our lives are more secure in Christ than our money is in cryptocurrency on this earth. <laughs> N.T. Wright, in his book, Paul for Everyone, he says, one aspect of Christian maturity, and certainly one of the road signs on the surprising route to Christian holiness, is that the mind must grasp the truth. You died and your life has been hidden with the king in God. Once the mind has grasped it, the heart and will may start to come on board. And once that happens, the way lies open to joyful Christian holiness. Don't settle for shortcuts. So we are to set our, our hearts and minds on this, and we are to grasp this truth that we have died with Christ and we are raised with Christ. And as a result of that, we are to seek the things above. Like he says in verse 1 and 2, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, when I started studying this, I was like, oh, that's cool. Like we have these two phrases, set your hearts and set your minds and the same word there. And then I started to look at the Greek and realized it's two different words here. Why is it the same word in English? Um, and so I'm a nerd, so I'm going to share with you the Greek because I love Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> um, but the first one here is zateo, and it means to seek in order to find, to seek after, seek for, aim at, strive after. And the other translations of the Bible, um, they'll translate this verse, seek the things above, instead of start your, set your hearts on things above. And the same verb is used in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God, or Matthew 7, 7, seek and you will find. So this idea of seeking, with, that involves our heart, and much more, seeking uh, the things above. And then verse 2, we see the word um, phroneo, uh, which means to direct one's mind to a thing, to seek or strive for, so basically to think on. So we are to seek the things above and we are to think the things above. 
directing both our hearts and our actions and our wills and our minds on the things above. The things above where Christ is seated right next to the Father. So we are to seek heavenly things instead of earthly things because we have died to the world and have been raised with Christ and our life is now hidden in him. That is where our true and ultimate home is, not this earth. And one day, Christ, who is our life, Paul says, will, be, will return and we will be raised with him in glory. So we have been raised with Christ in the past. Our lives are hidden with Christ in the present. And we will be raised with Christ in the future. And Paul wants believers to have our focus be on the things above because, as one commentator, David E. Garland, said, He wants our moral vision to be controlled by the divine reality that is coming. He wants us to have a kingdom mindset, to think things of the kingdom, to think on God, to to act (laughs) in such a way. However, this does not mean we should cut ourselves free from our physical and practical living here on earth because Christians are not called to escape the world, um, but to follow Christ within the world. By fixing our hearts and minds on God and things above, we can avoid becoming ensnared by the world and its temptations. So Paul is talking about our orientation in life, the direction our lives are aimed in, where our priorities lie. Now, being raised with Christ emphasizes the new status of believers, and that truth is our power source for living a new life, which he calls us to do. So since you have died with Christ and been raised with Christ, you are to set your hearts and minds on Christ. That should define the direction our lives are heading, the things we are seeking, the thoughts we are thinking, the priorities we are making. Wright also says in that book, once you realize that, that truth of being dead and now alive in Christ. There appears before you the new way towards a genuine, fulfilling holiness. If you were raised to life with the king, search for the things that are above. Learn to think about the things that are above, not the things that belong to the present world of change and decay. In fact, learning to think rather than merely going with the flow of the world on, lo- on the one hand or blindly obeying what looks like stringent regulations on the other is part of the key to it all. Now, one really simple, basic way of doing this is to spend more time in scripture. As cheesy and Christianese as that sounds, that's a beautiful way to fill your heart and your mind with things above. Um, And recently, I downloaded this app called Dwell. And it basically, it's just a form of an audio Bible, and it has different plans in it, um, different voices that read to you, and it has beautiful piano background music. Um, And I started listening to this because during Lent, I decided to give up social media in the morning because I was tired of starting my day off with social media. And so instead, Um, when I was getting up and getting ready, I just started listening to this Dwell app. And it was such a great way for me to set my heart and mind on things above, on God, on scripture, instead of on earthly things, which social media can cause me to start to think about. And so I I love the way the message puts these verses, um, which is a paraphrase and a good supplemental resource for us to use. Uh, It says, so if you are serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. 
So this first section in Colossians 3 lays out what we are to do, to seek and think on the things above, and to live into that reality that we have been raised with Christ and we have new life that is hidden and secure in Christ. And then in the next few verses, we see more of the, the implications of what this life has for us and what we are to do in light of that truth. So starting in verse 5, Paul says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. So here in these few verses, we see a couple vice lists, they're called. Um, and vice and virtue lists were very common um, back in this day. And not only in the Bible, which you'll see them all throughout, especially in the New Testament, but even in other ancient Near Eastern texts, this vice and virtue list were used. And so Paul is saying that since believers are to seek heavenly things as a result to, of dying to the world and the old self and being raised with Christ, we must also set aside the sinful lifestyle of the old world and our old selves. First, we see that we are to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly natures. Other translations basically say, consider them dead. Romans 6, 11 has something similar where Paul says, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in, Je in Jesus Christ. So our old self is dead, which we see in verse three, and so are the things that came with the old self. But we still need to actively continue to put them to death. And this is serious stuff because Paul doesn't just say, oh, um, if you can, you should probably avoid these few things, you know, if you can, but like no pressure and like just try to avoid them. No, he says put them to death. Charles Spurgeon, uh, he once said, I cannot, if Christ died for me, I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. I love that. And then he, he also said, when we deal seriously with our sin, God will deal gently with us. So we are to deal seriously with our sin. And that means putting it to death. Now, sadly, when we start to follow Christ, our sinful nature doesn't just disappear and we don't have to worry about it anymore. It's still there and still something that we have to, have to fight and we have to work to put it to death. So we're called to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature. And it, in this list that, or sorry, in, in verse 8, he also parallels it with another phrase, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. And after both of these statements, we get a list of five. And so in the first list, Paul says to put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And then the second list in verse 8, he says, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. And the first set has to do with sex, and the second set has to do with speech. And these are two central areas of human life, and they both have great potential for good and for evil. And in these lists, we see how they are used for evil. We see the improper uses of these gifts from God, because both our sexual nature and our speech are gifts from God, and they are to be used in a, a glorifying way and to be used properly. But it's when these things are abused and used improperly that it, it results in sin and it results in hurting others and damaged relationships. Because any sexual relationships outside of marriage between a man and a woman it is sinful, as we see all throughout scripture. And we see lust in this list, which as we know from Matthew 5 and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that we just went through, that he equates lust with, with adultery. And then greed, which is essentially like the belief that, that everything, including other people, exists for one's own, own amusement, own pers personal amusement and purposes. 
And Paul adds on that this greed is idolatry because essentially it's turning our desires into idols. And then the second list that Paul goes through regarding speech is a bunch of sins of anger. Um, and so we've got anger that you can either express or, or maybe even hold in, which isn't great either, to outbursts of rage, to more subtle expressions of anger in the form of malice um, towards others or slander um, that we can use to speak bad about others around us. And as followers of Jesus, we are to use our speech to help and build up those around us. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Our speech is to build others up and benefit those who listen, not tear those around us down. And when we abuse our speech, it often hurts us and those around us. It tears apart community and relationships. I mean, did, did your parents or other adults in your life when you were younger say to you, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all? Yeah, and it, that's so true, although you probably shouldn't keep those things in either um, because you don't want bitterness to form towards those people. Just don't, don't think those bad things. <laughs> but um, this is... It's a problem, and it's a hard thing for especially young people to realize. Um, so I'm a CASA, which is a court-appointed special advocate, um, or at least I was. My case of 20 months actually just closed a few weeks ago, which is great. Um, but for the past 20 months, I have met with these three sisters once a week. Um, and we hang out, spend time together, build relationships and trust and have fun and I get to love on them and then speak on their behalf in court. And I remember last summer, there was one day that um, they got in trouble at uh, their summer program that they were going to and their foster mom told me about it before I picked them up. And so here I am sitting with these girls um, at the mall eating ice cream and I had to break out my, my tough side. Um, <laughs> and I had to tell them that what they did that day, the words that they used to hurt others was not okay. And they can't speak like that. Um, and then I got to talk about how we can use our words well and how it, they can either be used to tear others down and hurt them and, and cause a lot of damage or they can be used to build them up and encourage them and love them. I would like to say that that was the only time we had to talk about that, but it wasn't. It's a recurring <laughs> thing that we would have to talk through of how to use our words well. And that's a lesson that we all need to learn, how to use our world, words well. Because like James talks about in James 3, we need to tame our tongues because they can cause incredible damage if we don't use them well. And so both of these sets of vices are divisive. The sexual sins divide people from one another, and it affects way more people than just the two or few involved. It affects friends and families and communities. And the second set are sins uh, that are detrimental to personal relationships as well, and they can just completely destroy them. And in between these two sets of vices, we see that because of those things, the wrath of God is coming. And it, the wrath of God is not a fun thing to talk about. Um, but in Romans 1, Paul addresses it. And in this passage, he portrays that God's wrath is basically turning sinners over to themselves. Um, God doesn't get in the way of free will or the consequences of their choices, but instead leaves them to themselves when they choose to go through life alone without him. So essentially, if we choose chaos for our lives, chaos we will have. The immorality, the foolishness, the earthly consequences of these things are, are the punishments, not the cause for punishment. And so basically, we are punished by the sins we sin. The damaged relationships those sins cause, the hurt, the pain, and the chaos in our lives and those around us. That is punishment in and of itself. 
Of course, there's also the punishment of being separated from God, which is way worse than any earthly consequence we, we may face. And so that's why Paul says that, that we are to put these things to death. Put these, this, our earthly nature to death. And getting rid of these things will not only transform you individually, but it will transform your community, your family, your friends, and way more. And just imagine if we all did this, how things would look so differently. Not just here in, in our church or in our families, but in the world around us. If we actually put this into practice. Paul says in verse 7 that you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So all these things were a part of your old life. And your old self, your old way of being, which we are now to take off. That used to be us, but not anymore. Because we are made new. So we have to rid ourselves of such things to put to death our earthly nature and to fix our hearts and minds on the things above. The message paraphrase of verses 5 through 8 says, and that means killing off everything connected with that way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, doing whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of by God. It's because of this kind of thing that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all that stuff and not knowing any better. But you know better now, so make sure it's all gone for good. Bad temper, irritability, meanness, profanity, dirty talk. This work is not easy. It's difficult and it's, it takes a lot of work, but that's what we are called to do, to get rid of these things, put them to death. We have to get rid of the old self to do what is necessary in our new life, in the new you. So Paul continues on in verse 9, and he says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And so lying here we see is another vice that we are not called to do. And lying, as you know, probably from when you were younger at least, that it can get you into a lot of trouble and it can be very divisive. And so we are not to lie or do any of those other vices because we have taken off our old self with its practices. We have taken it off. That is not ours anymore. But we're not done because then we also need to put on the new self. We take off in order to put on. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like if I'm getting dressed in the morning, I'm not going to um, put my workout clothes over my pajamas, and then after I work out, I'm not going to put my clothes for the day on over those clothes and have a third layer of clothes and then just continue layering them on. Like, that's not what you do. You have to take off one set of clothes before you put on the new set of clothes. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's like, in order to put on the new you, the new self, you need to take off the old. You can't keep that on, especially because it's really dirty. <laughs> and if you put new clothes over old dirty clothes, you're just going to get your new clothes dirty. Because this is not something you can just cover up. Paul doesn't say to just put on the new over the old and cover it up. Because that's not how it works. The old must be stripped away, thrown out. We cannot skip over this part of dying with Christ. Because once we do that, then we are raised with him and we can be our new selves, put on the new clothes, our new life that is hidden in Christ. And that new self, Paul says, is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of, of our creator. And it, the image of God, this is a phrase that we see all throughout scripture. And it first appeared in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are all made in the image of God. 
that is inherent in each and every single human being who has ever lived and ever will live. And with that comes an inherent value and worth. And that's why we make the Imago bags that are in the back of the room by the doors. Bags that are filled with things like food, first aid kit, sanitizer, socks, and a Bible, and much more. And we call them Imago bags because in Hebrew, image of God is Imago Dei, Imago bags. Um, <laughs> And we make them so that you can all grab them and keep them in your car. And when you see someone who is in need on the side of the street, when you pull up to a stoplight, you have a practical way of loving them and treating them as someone who is made in the image of God, not just someone you ignore because you don't know what to do. Because it is in his image, in the image of our creator, that we are being renewed. And this renewing is ongoing. It's not just a one and done thing. It's something that we continue to go through throughout our lives. The verb here in Greek is a present participle, which means that it is continuous. So we need continuous improvement and renewal. Transformation is a process. Because there is the declaration that we are new and we are holy, and that is called sanctification. But then there is also transformation, which is the process of becoming new and holy. And this is a work of God in us. But we also have work to do, like we see in Colossians 3. We need to put those things to death, stop doing those things, get rid of it. So we need to recognize the truth of who we are, that we are new, and start living like it. You have new life in Christ, so take off the old and put on the new. Off with the old and on with the new. Garland says in his commentary, theological indicatives are the basis of the ethical imperatives. You are, now be. The truth of our new life in Christ is the basis for how we are called to live. You are, now be. You are new, now be new. You are new, so start acting like it. Start living like it. Take off the old self and put on the new self. You are, now be. In Christ, we are new. And in Christ, we are defined by Christ. All of us. Paul says in verse 11, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, Barian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In Christ there there are no longer these religious or cultural divisions, but Christ is all and is in all. So in Christ there is no room for those kinds of distinctions, no room for us and them. No matter your race or your gender, your denomination, your political party, your, um, where you're from, your financial status, your relationship status, or anything else, because we are all one in Christ. And that is one of the most beautiful things about knowing Christ, is you can be with anyone, and if you both know Christ, you have that in common, and that is the most important thing. So just as we are to get rid of the old sinful self, we are also to get rid of the old sinful distinctions that have been used to separate and segregate humans from one another. And in this passage, he he breaks down those different barriers or divisions, mainly religious and cultural distinctions. Religious and ethnic divisions like Jews versus Gentiles, Jews that were circumcised and Gentiles that were not. Then barbarian and Scythian, who is believed to be a worse form of barbarity. And then slave or free, so breaking down all of those cultural divisions. And that's what the gospel does. The gospel breaks down all of these man-made walls. The gospel does not classify people by any of those things that we as humans may tend to classify people by. Because instead of being in Christ, instead being in Christ is what matters most. And he isn't saying that those things are not true about you or important. 
Um, because as Christians, we all still have our ethnic identity, our race, our gender, and all of those things that are beautiful about us. But in Christ, what is most important, where our identity comes from, is him. That is what defines us. I mean, we see in Revelation 7 that there is a great multitude of people before the, the throne of the Lamb of God, worshiping him. And it said that it was people from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. That is what heaven is like. People from everywhere, all different people, worshiping God together. And I hope that the church here on earth can resemble that as well and get rid of all of those stupid divisions and prejudices that have been used to separate people for so long. Because in Christ, we are one. The message goes on to finish out this section. Don't lie to one another. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothing that you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ Everyone is included in Christ. So this morning, I want you to just take some time to ask yourself, what do you need to put to death? What do you need to get rid of? Is it lust? Is it greed? Maybe anger or rage? Maybe slander or lying? What part of your old self have you not taken off yet? Do you still have your old, stinky, dirty clothes on? That old self, the old you? Because until you take off the old, you cannot put on the new. And spoiler alert, like you'll see next week, the, the new you and the new self is a beautiful thing. Next week, Mike is going to talk through verses 12 through 17 in Colossians 3 and look at what this new self looks like, what we are to put on. Worship team, you can come back up. And it, this taking off of the old and old clothes and putting on new ones isn't a new thing either. Because this, this has echoes of Genesis 3 where after Adam and Eve sinned, their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and put it on themselves to cover, cover themselves up. Then after God explained to them and the serpent the consequences of their sin, you know what he did? He clothed them. He made garments of skin for Adam and Eve and he clothed them. Their self-made clothes that were a representation of their alienation from God, they were not good enough for those who are being redeemed and reconciled to God. And so they were removed and replaced with divine handmade clothing. And we too are called to take off our old clothes and put on the new we too are reconciled to God through Christ, and our old clothes are unfit for us anymore. Take off the old self and put on the new self that is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of our creator. Get rid of the old self so you can put on the new self. You are new, now go be new. You are, now be. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you um, for how you make us new. No matter how sinful, how dirty we, we were, you love us completely. And you wash those things away when we come to you. So Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength and the wisdom and, and the power to get rid of these things, to put them to death. Take off the old self so that we can put on the new. 
pray that you would reveal those areas that, that we need to get rid of so that we can step into the new life you have for us. Lord, you are so good. And we thank you for, for, for the clothes that you made for us, the new clothes that we can put on. Lord, would you just continue to speak through us, to us and work through us and in us as we continue in worshiping and responding to your word. Amen.